Um, I'm going to talk about the myth of race, so that's the title of my talk. In actual fact, I'm going to talk about three scientific myths. Firstly, I'm going to tell you uh, why vitamin D is not a vitamin. Sorry for all those making a living out of selling it. <laughs> um, secondly, I'm going to tell you that the concept of dividing our one human race into many based on color is flawed. And thirdly, I'm going to tell you that someone called Darwin was wrong, or where he was wrong. So firstly, you know, when you look at skin um, color, which is partly what I'm going to talk about, um, there's really the science, and on the flip side, you have the emotion. So I must confess that, you know, I'm a, I have a bit of skin in the game, because that's my job, my, my research, my vocation, my education, right. So, but when you think about skin scientifically, um, skin is our only essential organ. Aristotle once said that all other organs evolve for well-being, not being. So you can live without hearing, smell, taste, vision, but you cannot live without touch. The second thing is, skin is our only universal organ. So the, as we'll see during this journey, the next few minutes, they're creatures without hearts and creatures without brains, but everyone's got skin. There is another side to skin, and that's the emotional side. And many of you here, or almost everybody, has some emotional attachment to skin. You know, you may be feeling a great sense of pride that your skin is glowing today, you may have a touch of anxiety that's getting a little symptoms of aging, or perhaps a bit of fear for skin cancer, which is when you come and see me. Um, as we saw in earlier talks, you know, the oceans and the water are very important because life evolved there. So if you want to go to the origins of something, we always go to the bottom of the ocean. So that's why when NASA wants to try and find out if there's life on Mars, we're trying to see if there's water. I think John F. Kennedy once said that all life evolved in the ocean and we're all tied to the ocean. And he said, when we go to the beach, even to sail or to swim, we go back whence we came from. So on my journey, the first creature I came across was a starfish. You know, a starfish is a wonderful creature, but it's heartless. Actually, it's got no heart, but it loves shucking oysters rather heartlessly. <laughs> and the next, you have the sea squirt. I mean, there are many other pictures of sea squirts. They're all beautiful creatures. Actually, they've got two life forms. And one form, they've got these beautiful tentacles, and they're all crawling around the bottom of the ocean, looking for love. Once they find in love, fall in love with a rock, they grab hold of it and never let go. <laughs> and at this point in time, they begin to digest the brain. So there's a moral of the story, see? See, the brain was all about movement. So you guys should be actually moving around by listening to me. Because if you find your rock, get married, just sit in front of the TV, you may as well eat your brain with a packet of chips. <laughs> But you see, the thing is, when you had single cell creatures at the bottom of the ocean, the mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of the cell, also function as calcium stores. So why did even single cell creatures, for the first 1,500 million years, all creatures had only one cell? And when they had one cell, they had a calcium metabolism. So seawater has 10 times the calcium as fresh water, and as creatures moved from the depths of the ocean onto fresh water and onto land, they needed calcium regulated. So for example, if you're at the bottom of the ocean, it's very easy. You can get calcium to maintain your exoskeleton, which is your outside, or what we call the endoskeleton, which is your cartilage, it's simply because there's so much calcium leaching into you, you really want something to keep it out. Come out of fresh water, that's not the case. So you need something to regulate it, because the cells have got so used to having calcium in a precise concentration. And that's when you need a regulator. So what vitamin D, it's nothing but a regulator of calcium. So here's the thing about vitamins. See, vitamins are not supposed to be produced by the body. But think about vitamin D. You go out in the sun, you produce vitamin D. So one, it's not a vitamin. Now the second thing is, hormones are things that regulate a particular chemical in the body or a particular organ. And if you look at it, all our calcium is regulated by vitamin D, the metabolism and the channels. 
And therefore, vitamin D is really a hormone wolf dressed like a vitamin sheep. Now, the next part of this story is a tale of two vitamins. So, you see, in my, uh, you know, real life work, um, other than writing books, you have to operate on people to do skin cancer. But I'm also an animal biologist, so sometimes I'm called to operate on animals. So there are some pictures there of me trying to get a tempter lemur down to operate on a tumor on its tail, or me operating on an orangutan. You see, there's a problem um, when you're operating on animals and on humans, because sometimes you can't tell them who your last patient was. <laughs> you see, this particular case, I finished this operation, I went back and I had this procedure to do, and I was thinking, I can't tell her where, who my last patient was, especially like me, you know, you're a global citizen, you speak with a mixed up accent, she's going to think I bet he trained at some dodgy university in India and he's a monkey doctor. <laughs> but, but really what operating on apes taught me was, it fascinated me that their skin was a lot pinker than it should be. Every time you shave the skin, I'm like, man, this is pink. Why did that happen? So to understand that, we've got to go back to our origins. First man evolved in Africa 200,000 years ago and migrated out of Africa 100,000 years ago. The first apes evolved 28 million years ago. Like I said earlier, the parable of the sea squirt tells us that the brain is all about movement. So, you know, here's what's interesting. Movements which simulate walking, because humans, what differentiated us from apes is we started walking upright, walking two-legged. When you walk two-legged, you have more neuronal stimulation than anything else. So, in actual fact, a recent study done which showed compared exercises like Tai Chi and yoga and Tango, which reduced dementia and also improved movement in Parkinson's disease, guess what? Tango won, because it's about two-legged movement. So what happened is, as the human being started moving more and more on two legs, the brain developed and they needed a larger brain. So a larger brain is nothing but a larger computer. So if you have a larger computer, you need a larger cooling system. So when you have a larger cooling system, or to get that cooling system, you begin to shed your fur. So we shed our fur, and we retained our hair because hair tells us where insects are sitting on us, so on and so forth. But most of us retained a bit of fur on our head. I'm not looking in any particular direction here. <laughs> right. But what happened is as we started shedding fur, if your skin does not darken, then what happens when light hits skin, photolysis happens. And photolysis does two things. On one hand, it destroys folic acid. On the second thing, it produces vitamin D. So if your folic acid is destroyed, you can't reproduce or you get birth defects. So that's why the skin in Africa darkened. But because this happened over 28 million years, there was enough evolutionary time slowly for the vitamin D levels to be, pre-vitamin D to be developed in the body. Now what happened, these people then migrated into Europe. So when they migrated into Europe, the skin started to lighten again, why? because there was no sun. So they needed to get what little vitamin D there was to maintain their calcium levels. So if your skin lightens and you're darker in Europe, you develop rickets, this disease of vitamin D deficiency. Now what does rickets do? On one hand, it makes you infertile, which means you're not going to reproduce, because even plants need um, you know, um, vitamin D um, receptors to pollinate. So what happened? But on the other hand, when you have a vitamin D deficiency and rickets, you get deformed and bent and stooped over. So it's very easy to see the origins of feelings of racial superiority, because if people were there deceased and not in their prime, obviously people who were lighter skinned and they were taller and more upright thought that they were superior. Now when people migrated to Asia, that was only in the last uh, 10,000 years, the skin once again darkened. Why? Again, it was a battle between vitamin D and folate. But once again, they were going to the tropics. Once again, you needed to preserve your folic acid. See, the beauty of the story is that a lot of what we see around us about life can be explained by the tale of two vitamins. So, for example, this is a chart of population densities of the world. If you're sitting here and thinking, oh, you know, the Maori population in New Zealand is growing faster, that's biological fact, because the darker skinned you are, the more folic acid you have, and the better breeder you are. So if you look at the populations, that's the reason why Asia and Africa have larger populations, simply because they're darker skinned. A study done in America was puzzled by the fact that actually there was a dis discrepancy between African Americans and 
Hispanics, where African Americans actually had a lower birth rate defect, which you wouldn't put when you consider socioeconomic status, and that was because of the origins out of Africa versus out of Europe. A slum in Bombay has a far lower birth defect rate with no medical care than a wealthy suburb in Belgium. Now, the second thing is, like I said, when people moved to Asia, and as the skin darkened again, this happened over a shorter period of time. So they didn't have enough time to develop the pre-vitamin D levels as Africans did. So what does it mean? It means that people like me from the Indian subcontinent, we suck at track and field, which is so bad, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, there's, India's got a population one billion plus. Guess how many Olympic track and field medals we won? I can hear hands going 10, 20, zero, right. So the poster up there is called Bag Milka Bag. It's actually India's most inspirational middle distance runner. His family was slaughtered in Partition, Pakistan. He ran, ran literally to India. He died under the bodies of his parents, broke the Olympic record in Rome. The problem was the other three guys ahead of him also did it and he finished fourth. <laughs> right. Or you can be out of Africa and have high pre vitamin levels, or you can be like the Jamaicans, right. So what we know is we can virtually predict the Olympic track and field medals based on your pre-vitamin D levels. But there is a message here about vitamin D deficiency. So in India, a lot of vegetarian population don't eat any fish, have low vitamin D levels, and they also inherently have low vitamin D levels because of evolution and where they migrated to. So if you have low vitamin D levels, that means you no longer have your calcium regulator and then you begin to eat calcium, as in milk, dairy. What does it do? The calcium is not regulated, so it goes to where it shouldn't go to, to your arteries, so it increases your rate of heart disease and diabetes. So we know this is now one of the reasons for a high rate of that in the tropics. But we also know, increasingly, that it has implications here, because people are so frightened of skin cancer, they don't have enough vitamin D, and if you don't supplement it enough, and you're eating a lot of dairy, then you find that you can end up with what we call a calcium paradox. Now, the next part is, where was Darwin wrong? See, Darwin said that various skin colors lived in various continents, and it had no, nothing to do with corresponding differences in climate. See, Darwin was right and wrong, actually. He was right because it didn't have anything to do with geography, but it had something to do with Karabawa diet. So, you know, one day a week, I take time out and I read um, stories to children in lower decile schools, because obviously making creative writing fun helps their math and science. So I was reading this kid's this story, and it was called The Polar Bear Sun. It's actually an Inuit story, an Eskimo story. And I was thinking, you see, polar bear's beautiful white bleached fur because it lives at the North Pole where you have high UV. But you shave a polar bear and the skin is black. Why? And so is the Eskimo skin. Because when these people migrated to the North Pole, their diet was so exclusively full of salmon and cod, which had 1,200 international units of vitamin D per teaspoon, that they didn't need to lighten their skin along with the others. We know for a fact that the bears migrated with the humans into Europe, but the polar bears didn't lighten their skin. So to prove this theory, I found myself at the Miss World beauty pageant, purely for research. <laughs> and, and you see, you have um, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. These three countries had warmer currents when people migrated from Africa. So these countries could farm grain. All the others around, like Norway and so on and so forth, they would just club seals and whales and salmon and just eat them. So as you can see, um, Miss Norway has a much better tan than Miss Estonia, while Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia are the three whitest countries in Europe. I was in India recently, speaking about the caste system, and I saw this book in a library, and there was a picture of a fairer-skinned man or lighter-skinned man and a darker-skinned man, and there it says Brahmin, and on the other side it says beggar. You see, the funny thing is, again, that's a myth because the upper-class Brahmins were all vegetarians in India, so they ate no fish. I mean, if any of you is thinking you can just eat your way to whiteness, it won't happen in your lifetime. <laughs> right. It, it, it takes about 400 years, right? But, but just in case you're wondering. But, but, but what happened is, in India, the upper-class became lighter and lighter and lighter-skinned 
because of their diet. But the others, because they were better athletes and they were eating and uh, fish and other forms of meat which had vitamin D, their skin ended up, didn't need to, same thing as what happened in Europe. So really, again, the caste system is a myth because we can explain it based on our diet. And hence, we can also explain the obsession in Asia about wanting to have white skin. You see, when you come back to the final analysis, we have biology and we have bigotry. Now, what does biology tell us? Biology tells us that 100,000 years ago, we were one human race which came out of Africa and migrated into Europe. In fact, the Aboriginals came straight over to Australia 50,000 years ago. Biology tells us that based on what we ate and where we moved to, we developed different skin colors and we also developed slightly different statures. My, if my parents knew my research, I would have been two inches taller because I would have been supplemented with vitamin D at birth. <laughs> right, but never mind, can't go back now. But thirdly, biology also tells us that a lot of this is now irrelevant because our diets are all becoming the same. You know, when I first came to New Zealand, there were no Indian restaurants properly. So the thing, what I mean is that we're all eating more the same foods, but more importantly, we're able to supplement our cereals with vitamin D or our bread with folate. We're able to just take pills if you want to. So as time goes down with the track, fast forward a bit, New Zealand will be a lot browner because of a high UV. Your descendants will be a lot browner than you are, but also vitamin D will be more or less the same. And what will happen then is India will finally win one track and field medal, but, but actually, that's, that's irrelevant in New Zealand. Where rugby is a religion, right? We're going to have an Asian all black at some stage. <laughs> but on the other side, biology can't explain certain things. And that's this, biology cannot explain why is it that in New Zealand or in around the world, sometimes being brown means being poor. Biology cannot explain why we have events like in Ferguson or at Charleston in America. Why we even need a hashtag which says, Black Lives Matter. And biology um, you know, cannot also explain that when we're dealing with refugees, often subconsciously, our reaction to them depends on their skin color. You see, I'm a medical person, I'm a scientist, and science by nature has no bias in our research, right? But as a final message, as a doctor, I'm supposed to be a healer. But if I have one wish for all of us, I'm not going to wish us all well, I'm going to wish us all ill, not ill, but a tiny little symptom, and a symptom called color blindness. If the world was truly color blind, every human being in every corner of the world would be able to reach their potential. We won't have poverty, we'd all love one another, and at that time, we'd finally come to understand the myth of race has not served humanity well. Thank you.